ask anyone how they're doing these days, and more and more frequently you will hear the answer, busy. We really are more busy, it seems, than any generation before us. Just think about it. As technology has improved year after year, we have been trying to cram more and more into every waking hour of our lives. You've got eight to 10 hours worth of work to do at the office with a deadline at the end of the day, and by 6 p.m. you need to get Susie to her piano lessons. Oh, no, wait, that's Thursday. She needs to make it to her soccer practice today, and Johnny has Taekwondo, which means you probably need to eat dinner on the road, but you're supposed to have dinner with Mary. You probably need to reschedule anyway because you've got that class that you're taking and the big project due at the end of the week because if you finish that class and four more then you'll finally be done with your degree and you'll be likely to get that promotion or you could just apply for that job you saw up the road but that's 30 minutes of extra commuting time and more wear and tear on the vehicle and you still didn't get that appointment to get your oil changed but you can do that on Saturday no you can't do that on Saturday because you are busy why do we feel so busy today we think about all of the modern conveniences that we have. Shouldn't our lives be easier and simpler than they were 100 or 200 years ago? Well, in many ways, of course, our lives are easier. But think about how technology has made our lives more hectic. Once upon a time, there was a simpler life. When our time was occupied primarily with our own thoughts and those things that were physically in front of us, like a plow in our hands tilling the soil, or a sick child in need of care, or a friendly neighbor knocking on the door. But transportation technology, like planes, trains, and automobiles, has made our world smaller. So now anyone, whether friends, family, or work can occupy our time as long as we can travel to them or they can travel to us in a reasonable amount of time. And then of course there's communication technology like telephone and internet, which literally means that the entire world is at our fingertips. Until not too long ago, that required us being by the phone, which was actually corded to a wall or at our desks where our computers were practically mounted. But today, with smartphones and tablets and laptops, anyone in the world can occupy our time, or practically demand our time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in a year, for the rest of your life. <laughs> so we feel busy. It's estimated that today you will take in the equivalent of 174 newspapers worth of content. That's about five times what you would have taken in 30 years ago. Every single minute 204 million emails are sent around the world. And here's a fun fact. Today, you will reply to more text messages than your great-grandparents did in their entire lives. <laughs> it's true. The effect of this is somewhat like being on a treadmill. You've been on a treadmill, right? You start off at a nice slow pace and you're feeling confident you're not even breaking a sweat. So then you bump up the speed a little bit. Now you're walking briskly and you're starting to feel pretty good about yourself. So you bump up the speed a little more. And now you're jogging, your confidence is growing. So you bump up the speed even more. And before you know it, you are sprinting just to stay upright so you don't fall on your face and end up on the next viral YouTube video. I think that's a way a lot of us feel today in our busy, fast-paced lives. And this has effects on our health, both physically and spiritually. Physically, this leads to stress which affects our immune system. It causes difficulty sleeping, and we're already sleeping less 
than our grandparents did. It causes a host of medical issues like headaches and heart problems and skin conditions and weight gain. But it also has spiritual effects. We've turned busyness into one of our highest virtues. We wear it like a badge of honor in our conversations with one another. But busyness in and of itself is not a virtue. Things like hard work and dedication are virtues. But busyness just means you're doing a lot of things. It doesn't mean you're doing important things or good things. Most importantly, busyness can cause us to completely overlook the very meaning of our lives. Jesus said, What does it benefit a person to gain the whole world but lose his soul? The gospel, instead, calls us to find rest and peace in Jesus Christ. That word gospel is a word that we use a lot and hear a lot, but we sometimes have a hard time defining. And that, in part, is because it depends who you ask. If you ask an evangelical, you may hear that the gospel is the truth that faith in Jesus gives us eternal life. If you ask an Anglican or an Episcopal, you may hear that the gospel is Jesus' call to transform the world through love and compassion. If you ask a Catholic, you may get a blank stare. But all of those responses, even the blank stare, contain a grain of truth. The gospel really is about eternal life. The gospel really is about this life. And the gospel really is a mystery that we shouldn't oversimplify. The best summary that I've seen, though, is one that I've read from Catholics like Pope Benedict and from Anglican and evangelical authors. And it goes something like this. It's based on the word gospel itself. The word gospel was already in use in the time of Jesus in Latin and Greek. And it referred to the announcement that a new king had taken the throne. So imagine if an old king has died or has been conquered, the new ruler would send out messengers to the end of the kingdom with the announcement, the good news, that he was now in charge. Similarly, the Christian gospel is the good news that God himself has come among us in Jesus Christ, has conquered sin and death, and is now ushering in his kingdom. God, from the very beginning of humanity, in fact, for, for all of eternity, has had a plan for our lives and has loved us more than we can possibly imagine. And yet we've rejected him. And we've rejected his plan. And we've rejected his love. We call that rejection sin. Instead, we so often allow ourselves to be ruled by our own desires, like our desire for money, our desire for fame, our desire for success, our desire for pleasure. But no matter how frantically we chase those things, none of those things can save us from what is our most obvious enemy, death. All of us will die. Every single one of us, whether you are a billionaire or a beggar, a celebrity or a nobody, will one day be worm food. But the good news is that God has come among us in Jesus Christ to conquer sin and to conquer death, to give us new life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came among us, and unlike us, he lived a life of perfect obedience to God's plan and perfect love, even to the point of laying down his life, dying on a cross. And thus he conquered our sin. But Jesus didn't stay dead. On Easter Sunday, he rose from the grave, conquering death itself and giving us hope of eternal life if we believe in him and follow him. 
Jesus then ascended into heaven, poured out his Holy Spirit, giving us a share in his own power so that we can believe in him and follow him. And now he reigns in heaven, enthroned at the right hand of God the Father. He promises to come again, to judge the living and the dead, to bring about that kingdom fully. But even now, that kingdom has begun to the extent that we allow him to reign in our lives. All of us are called to be disciples. A disciple is someone who believes in Jesus, who learns from him, and who strives to follow his teaching and his example. It's our most basic call to proclaim with our lips and our lives that Jesus is Lord. Jesus promises us, as his disciples, that we will find rest. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus, then, is calling us to turn from hurriedness to holiness. I don't want to give you the impression that Christianity is about sitting back and watching the world go by. It's obviously not. Jesus was a man of action, but he was also a man who had a unique inner peace. I don't want to imply that Christianity will make our lives stress-free and take away all the demands of life, because it won't. In fact, living a Christian life is often more demanding than the alternative. But I am saying that the teachings of Jesus and Catholic tradition offer us insights to help us reprioritize and reorganize our lives to find sanity in the midst of a very fast-paced world and to find peace. In the first few centuries of church history, people who were interested in becoming Christians would spend months or even years learning about the way of life that Jesus calls us to. This process of formation was called the catechumenate, and those who were being formed were called catechumens. They were citizens of Rome who were learning to be citizens of the kingdom of God. They would spend the last 40 days of their preparation in prayer and fasting, examining their own lives, asking what needed to change in order to live this new way of life. And then the night before Easter Sunday, all who were to be baptized and brought into the church would be gathered in total darkness. They would be asked to face the west where the sun had set, and they would renounce sin and Satan. They would often be stripped naked as a sign of taking off that old way of life. They would turn towards the east where the sun would rise. And then they'd be asked to profess their faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they'd be dunked into the waters of baptism and clothed with a white garment symbolizing the freely given eternal life that they had received from Jesus and the new way of life that came along with that. Even though the rituals of the church have changed over the centuries, all of us today are still called to make that same change of life that those early Christians made. We have to turn away from anything that keeps us away from God and turn towards Him through Jesus Christ. In fact, the 40 days of Lent that we continue to celebrate year after year are based on those 40 days of preparation in the early church. I'd suggest that that conversion that we are called to today includes turning from the hurried, frantic, fast pace of life where there is no room for God 
towards a life where God is given priority. We're called to turn from hurriedness to holiness. In this series, we will learn to make time for Jesus. And each session, I'll be offering a simple discipline to help us do so. Our first discipline is the simplest of all. Each year, make time for Easter. And I don't simply mean showing up for Mass on Easter Sunday, although that's an excellent start. I mean making that commitment to the new way of life that Jesus calls us to. In fact, every Easter Sunday, we renew the promises of our baptism during Mass. So if you're watching this series and Easter is right around the corner, then redouble your efforts to prepare your heart for Easter, asking what things need to change in order to live the life that Jesus calls us to. If you're watching this and Easter is still nine or ten months away, then don't wait. We're called to make this commitment every single day. Commit yourself to live as a disciple of Jesus. Along the way in this five-part series, we'll be looking at one of the greatest masterpieces of Western literature, Dante's Divine Comedy. Through that story, we'll be seeing what Catholics believe about heaven, hell, and purgatory to see how a Christian vision of eternal life should change the way we live our everyday lives. So the next time someone asks you how you're doing, I hope that you'll think twice before just saying, busy. Obviously, you can answer however you want to, and if you feel busy, then say you're busy. But my hope is that over the course of these five sessions, you'll go closer to Jesus Christ, the source of peace and rest and happiness, and that closer to Him, you will feel something other than, well, busy.